Thanks for joining us today as we look at this new release, The Great Awakening, A History of the Revival of Religion in the Time of Whitfield and Edwards by Joseph Tracy. This is a time where we're going to look through this new release, uh, have a look at the table of contents and a couple choice sections from the book to give you a real feel for what the book's about, how it reads, uh, what it looks like, and just to help you decide if this is a book that you'd like to pick up from the Banner of Truth. So, uh, this book has been printed by us before. Uh, one thing I like to do whenever I get a new banner book is to check and see the last time that it's been published. This is something that some people like to gloss over, but I think it's actually really interesting information because one of the things that we do is we reprint a lot of older books that we think are still valuable today. So this book was first published in 1842. The first banner edition was in 1976. We reprinted it in 1989 and then again in 1997 in a paperback. But it's been a while since we've had it in public or had it in print, and uh, we've recently retyped it and reprinted it in this cloth-bound edition here in 2019. Um, just a brief look at the table of contents. I want to spend most of our time looking at sections from the book, but just to give you a feel for what the book's on or what it covers, uh, it's going to be it's a book covering the the Great Awakening in America, and particularly looking at the ministry of Whitfield. You'll see his his name come up a lot here. His early life, his labors. Um, parties in the Presbyterian Church, but also uh, the life of Jonathan Edwards and North his the the revival that happened there in Northampton. More stuff here on Whitfield, um, and then over here through the revival that continued in the South, uh, the controversy in Massachusetts, and then at the end of the book, something we'll look at um, before we conclude is the results. Tracy does not just give you the historical facts; he wants to analyze it theologically and ask questions. You know what? Did the Lord really do through this, and what can we learn today? Okay, so I'm going to just turn to one of the first sections of the book I want to read to you to give you a flavor for Tracy's writing. He's talking about the, the beginning of the Great Awakening, which happened in Northampton, as we'll read in 1734. He writes, It was in the latter part of December 1734, as Edwards informs us, that the Spirit of God began extraordinarily to set in and wonderfully to work among us. And there were very suddenly, one after another, five or six persons who were, to all appearance, savingly converted, and some of them wrought upon in a very remarkable manner. He then goes on to talk about this lady who was converted and the impact that her uh, conversion had on the whole community. He writes, The news, that is, of this lady being converted, the news of it seemed to be like a flash of lightning upon the hearts of the young people, all over the town and upon many others. Many went to talk with her concerning what she had met with, and what appeared in her seemed to be seemed to be to the satisfaction of all that did so. The consciences of men were constrained to acknowledge the goodness of the power which had wrought such a change in such a person. Presently upon this, a great and earnest concern about the great things of religion and the eternal world became universal in all parts of the town, and among persons of all degrees and all ages. The noise among the dry bones waxed louder and louder. All other talk about spiritual and eternal things was soon thrown by. The minds of the people were wonderfully taken off from the world. It was treated among us as a thing of very little consequence. They seemed to follow their worldly business more as a part of their duty than from any disposition they had to it. Uh, I think that's a wonderful picture of the work of regeneration in the lives of people as they see that eternal things are so much more important than things that are around us. Not that the things around us aren't important in their place, but there's, they should, certainly should be put in their place. Reading on the next page, Tracy talks more about the revival at Northampton. He says, Edwards hoped that more than 300 were converted in Northampton in half a year. They were of all ages, from the child of four years to the man of 70. Uh, so lots of work going on there by the Lord. The account which Edwards gives of the character of these converts is highly interesting and instructive, but cannot be transferred to this history. One characteristic, however, is too important to be passed without remark. It would seem that in every case the happy change came upon the sinner's mind, instead of being wrought by him. In no case, it seems, did the sinner first form to himself an idea of some volition to be put forth by himself, and then, by direct effort, put it forth and thus become a convert. Just a good point here by Tracy, obviously people were, were asking questions of this revival, people who doubted the work, that it was a genuine work of God, asking questions like, you know, is this really something that people are working up? Is it, are people just 
bringing this upon themselves, and he, he notes here that Edwards specially recorded that. This was not something that people were working up in themselves. It was the work of the Lord. So I'm going to fast forward here about 200 pages or so um, to show you another aspect of this book, which is just the, the wonderful quotations from Edwards and Whitfield. And I think it's another, uh, some of the value that this book gives you is you don't just get uh, Tracy's thoughts. You also get long, helpful quotes from the men who were preachers of that time and who were used by the Lord. So look, listen to this nice quote from Edwards. Uh, Tracy begins, the traits already mentioned imply a powerful imagination, speaking of Edwards, of course, and in this respect, he has seldom had a superior. Heaven and holiness were too heavenly and holy in his apprehension to be set forth by earthly imagery, yet he has left us some bright specimens of the beautiful. This is a quote from Edwards then. Holiness, as I then wrote down some of my contemplations on it, appeared to me to be of a sweet, pleasant, charming, serene, calm nature, which brought an inexpressible purity, brightness, peacefulness, and ravishment to the soul. In other words, it made the soul like a field or garden of God, with all manner of pleasant flowers, enjoying a sweet calm, and the gentle, vivifying beams of the sun. The soul of a true Christian, as I then wrote my meditations, appeared like such a little white flower as we see in the spring of the year, low and humble on the ground, opening its bosom to receive the pleasant beams of the sun's glory, rejoicing, as it were, in a calm rapture, diffusing around a sweet fragrancy, standing peacefully and lovingly in the midst of other flowers round about, all in like manner opening their bosoms to drink in the light of the sun. Tracy remarks on that remarkable passage. What delicate imagery is here, what exquisite personification of the flowers of the garden, endowing them with life and consciousness and moral beauty. How naturally these lovely musings, more harmonious numbers, so that his very words flow sweetly as he utters them. There's lots of quotes like that we could go through, but uh, I, I encourage you to purchase the book and have a look at some of them yourself. But uh, We'll move on then to just a section at the end. I mentioned that Tracy doesn't want to just give us the um, straight history and uh, you know just give you fact after fact after fact. He wants to analyze what's going on here in light of eternity and in light of you know what can Christians learn from this? How can we? How can the church uh, grow and learn from what went on? And so he starts to analyze near the end of the book the work of itinerant preachers and the dangers and some of the uh, constraints that surround the itinerant preaching and some warnings for men who might be too eager to get into it. He writes, If itinerants were to be employed, they must be encouraged to go through the land and preach to all indiscriminately, wherever they could. Thus and thus only could the hearers of contentedly unsuccessful ministers be effectually reached. It was done. The state of the country demanded and justified the doing of it. Whatever language of general approbation may have been used concerning the employment of itinerants, the controlling motive for employing them was evidently drawn from the existing need of their labors. Among the Presbyterians and in England, the same motives were avowed with less restraint. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, about, we're speaking about those churches that you would go to, I mean, some of them are not going to like what you're doing, of course. So the ministry for whose reformation such a system is adopted cannot be expected to submit to it quietly. It begins with an implied declaration that they are unfit for their places and unworthy of the confidence which is reposed in them, and of the emolements they receive, and it threatens to reduce them to their proper level. A few may be compelled by their own consciences to admit the truth of the charge and may reform, but generally they will resent and repel the attack. I think uh, as we analyze you know, itinerant ministries and, and think of our own churches that we're in, um, it's a little different than what was going on in the Great Awakening. I mean, some of these churches, these Men like Whitfield in the, in the England, the Wesley brothers, um, they were going to these places telling people in the churches that they were sinners. And they didn't, and these, these churches didn't want to hear that and were kicking people, these men, these preachers out of the Church of England for implying or saying, declaring that we're, even as Christians, we're sinners, we're, we're, we're terrible sinners and we need forgiveness. So think of that context as you think about the need of itinerant preachers. It's a little different than a healthy, vibrant church. And that's what, that's what, uh, Tracy's going to get to here. Um, he says, The events of the day, however, give no sanction to the employment of itinerants where there is no such need of them. How could they? 
How could the usefulness of evangelists in breaking in upon degenerate churches, in despite of unfaithful pastors, prove that they must be useful in a community of sound churches under faithful pastors? Uh, he goes on to say, uh, The history of that period, therefore, furnishes no dec decisive answer to the question whether itinerant evangelists ought to be employed among sound churches having faithful pastors, though it furnishes an abundance of facts from which a partisan may construct a plausible argument on either side. But it shows that churches may be so degenerate, and pastors so unsound, unfaithful, or contentedly unsuccessful as to justify and demand their employment. What he means by contentedly unsuccessful, I'm not 100% sure. You'll have to, I guess, read the book to figure that out. Um, the right of wrong of every case depend upon its circumstances and not upon any man's judgment concerning it. Uh, neither his office, and this is a good warning to our itinerants, neither his, speaking of the itinerant, neither his office nor his erroneous opinion that he is doing right, nor the approbation of any man or body of men can justify him in intruding his services upon those who would be better without them, or can bind any to receive his labors who do not need them. Uh, just being very clear here, it's helpful that, you know, what happened was special, and what happened with men like Edwards Whitfield preaching in different churches and, and in fields and across the country was, was because of the state of the churches and the state of the land, and, and it called for it. And that's, we have to analyze that and ask those questions. Are, uh, are, if you're going to embark on something like that, is the place that you're going to, is it calling for it? And we have to be careful. We don't want to step on the feet of faithful ministers. Just lastly, uh, a really good conclusion here on you know, not idolizing parts of church history. Tracy concludes, or will conclude our video with this quote, The spirit of any age is the spirit of the men of that age, the spirit of men either wholly sinful or sanctified but in part. It is therefore either wholly or in part a wrong spirit, and whoever gives himself up to be led by it without reserve will inevitably be led into sin and folly. Such persons, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. The spirit of the purest revival has in it a mixture of error and of evil and must be often corrected by a standard more perfect than itself, or it will bring itself to an end by its own faults. Detecting the faults of a revival, therefore, and correcting them, is a work of first importance. And that's a helpful, humble uh, declaration on these parts of church history. We need, to, we need to analyze them, we need to find the sin in them, and call it out, because we know that the men that God's used are sinful are sinners, and they're going to do things wrong, wrongly or unbiblically, and we need to call that out and not celebrate it. But the things that are good, the things that the, the Lord has blessed, we should seek to emulate, um, as Paul says, as he emulates or as he imitates Christ, so we imitate Him. Well, that's it for our book review of the Great Awakening. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and gave you a little flavor of the book. Encourage you to uh, look online and uh, find the Great Awakening at VanityTruth.org and perhaps add it to your reading list uh, for the summer. Uh, interesting quote here by Lloyd Jones, as I mentioned that he says, "I can I can recommend without hesitation the reading of the Great Awakening. It is really one of those marvelous, heartwarming books, and I cannot imagine a better way of spending a summer holiday. What Tracy gives is an account of true revival." Well, I echo his words and uh, hope you check out the book at Thanks for listening.